The other day, Jake took me to the ball joint. It's Jacob Krem. We walked in, and I felt suddenly as if I was side by side with Don Corleone in some Sicilian cafe. The owners were there, Brian and Amanda. Brian kissed the ring on Jake's finger. <laughs> then Brian looked at me and said, who's this? Jake said he's with me. That was enough for them, more than enough. I know this because Brian pulled me over the counter and Fredo kissed me. It tasted like meatballs and it was not unpleasant. <laughs> After dinner, Jake and I went bowling at Sims Lanes. And again, people were kissing Jake's ring and looking at me like I was about to die. <laughs> Jake said he's with me, and several shadows, which I only just noticed closing in around me, turned back into seemingly innocent bowlers. That night, Jacob told me a secret. He looked at me with old eyes, with the glittering eyes of an ancient man. I knew that if I let Jake tell me what he was about to tell me, I would never be the same. I also knew that if I didn't let him go through with it, the bowlers would feed my life's last breath to a Sims dumpster. Speak on, dear friend, I said. But Jake spake not. He showed me a key. What does it do, I said. It opens every lock, every door, every shut-up heart and secret sin on campus. It is the audiovisual student leader key. With a key like that, I said, you could shut down the entire campus. Movies wouldn't play, chapel would screech to a halt, and the, inter the internet is very slow. <laughs> that was you doing that? <laughs> AV has been given that power, Jake said. But why? Why would you make the internet so terrible? The internet is slow, Jake said, because I have been asked to make it slow. By who? The RPs. <laughs> it was them? They know better than anyone what the internet is, Jake said. What it can do. What it can bring about. Jake, RPs are basically the Amish. <laughs> except they allow mustaches. <laughs> They don't understand the internet. I talked to one the other day and he thinks the internet is a physical net for catching people. <laughs> oh, they understand the internet better than you could possibly imagine. And what makes you think it isn't a net for catching people? Because of, what? I'll give you a history lesson, Jake said. You probably think the Tower of Babel had to do with rock and stone. An ice cream cone tower reaching toward heaven, am I right? I pictured the image from my middle school Zondervan Get Ready for Bodily Changes Adventure Bible. <laughs> yes, the drawing depicted Babel as an ice cream cone of stone. What else was it, I said. Babel was the internet. Jake said. They found fiber optic cables in northeastern Syria buried a thousand feet down within rock. <laughs> Babel was the internet and a far more advanced form than what we have today. The secret of the internet has been safe for thousands of years and for all that time the reformed Presbyterians have been prepared to do anything to keep it safe. At this point Jake pulled down the collar of his t-shirt to reveal a tattoo on his chest. The image was of a line running through a circle. At first I didn't understand. Jake said nothing as I, with increasing discomfort, tried to decipher the symbol on his chest, a chest that wore a second beard, <laughs> thick and golden like Viking Velcro. <laughs> then, suddenly, I understood. The tattoo on his chest depicted a fiber optic cable running through rock. Jake continued, the internet has grown very powerful. It is not as sophisticated as Babel's net, but it stretches far wider. The RPs cannot wipe it out now as they did with Babel. All they can do is frustrate its high speeds. Geneva College is the last place on earth where the internet is this slow. 
This is the RP's masterpiece. They have long held the ability to release that stranglehold and allow a unity of communication that would bring about Babel once again and cover all the lands in a second darkness. The devil is seeking this. All his thought is bent on it. The internet yearns above all else to return to its former speed. They are one, the internet and the devil. So the RPs wait for the word from God. When they hear it, they will uncork this mighty technological bottleneck and bring about the ending of the world, but it is not yet. Now Jake leaned in and whispered, My friend, I graduate this year, and upon my graduation, I give that power to you. He held out his hand and there was the key. I do not want that power, I said. I have never wanted it. You cannot give me this. Jake smiled. It is mine to give to whom I will. And don't worry, I've made a copy. Ladies and gentlemen, Jacob Prem. The only reason I do these is this goes on my resume for my jobs when I graduate. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. All right, I'll get right into this then. This is called Phone Booth. Tonight my words are a grimy window pane, and this stage is a phone booth. If you look closely, you'll see my little cape fall to the floor as I slip into my sweater vest and my corduroys. I'm, fum I'm fumbling to put my thick glasses on my nose before I cinch up my tie. Right now, you're observing my subtle change into my mild-mannered alter ego. Gone is my jaw's stoic setting and blurred is the focused gaze in my eyes. My confident stride and coordination become bumbling and clumsy. Halting stutters mangle my articulate and glib demeanor. Tonight, like an awkward Clark Kent, or perhaps at moments a tortured Peter Parker, I will seek to understand and describe what role I play in the lives of those I love. Here, in this, I will push the coin return, hoping for Lady Luck's 10 cent smile, standing with my tights under my slacks. This next piece is about a friend of mine who I saw struggling in a very broken relationship, um, and I felt hopeless to be able to help her. Um, and this piece describes exactly how it felt. It's called Those Little Marshmallows. Winter is a gallery of grace. Soft snowfall and slender trees nearly arrested. Delicate glass where stagnant water once cooled. Smooth and frosted, a canvas for the bowl. Precise and glittering, the brushes do flow, carving twirls and glides in shapes intricate. Gloved hands grasping that specter, balance. Scarves and tassels trace the strokes delayed. Artists in tandem as others arrive. I look on in my muted content, Mug in hand, my marshmallows float. My, uh, my mind is eased, and my heart is soothed. My joy is found, but little will I retain. To share in this joy is my singular desire. But time hastens on, my virtues melting. Intimidated by those at the easel we view, with those who ponder and with those who gaze, here in the studio I marvel and stare, for there I see artwork no man could conceive. The form is feminine and the subject gentle. The focus is softened by flurried strokes. Vivid the palette and bright the scene. Radiant the reflections and hollow the shadows. Priceless to her craftsmen and dear to me, yet by tasteless critics bartered for. Around her they strut their admirable plumage. Furiously they circle and leap unashamed. Subtle and menacing, the canvas fractures. Elegantly perilous, the landscape tears. Persistent, I plead with my motives mixed. In hand, my meager virtue, the other extended. Distracted by frenzy, lost is view of the bank. Swept up in profane glory, she revels on. Away, my marshmallows shrink, and far the cracks spread. Tepid is my cocoa, but ablaze is her heart. Aware they must be, yet alarmed they are not. My watch I'll stand as vigilante had ca held captive. With purpose absent and resolve sat, I'll sit bound on this bench, snowy and damp, until my marshmallows find their worth, or until my humble cup runs dry. 
So I've read this to one of my friends, a roommate of mine, who happens to be um, a rather gifted songwriter. Um, and currently, he actually lives in Michigan. Um, he transferred um, home to another school. But before he did, he asked if we could make this into a sort of a love ballad um, by adapting the lyrics somewhat. Um, and I did. I'm going to read these to you, and then uh, we're actually going to listen to his song. He recorded it, mixed it, and did all of it himself. It's excellent. Um, but here's the lyrics first. Little girl, the air grows crisp tonight. You smile as the park comes in sight. Carefree you smile, bright with your friend. Together you'll be until the end. Trace your heart out for me. Just let yourself fly free. Write your words, sing your song. Little girl, dancing strong. Bundled up warm and hearts all aglow. Shapes on the ice, how they flow. Frenzy of passion, the blush brushes stroke. Unaware below you, the glass broken. Trace your heart out for me. Just let yourself fly free. Write your words, sing your song, little girl dancing strong. Watching from the bank, I call and plead. Mesmerized by him, you take no heed. My heart is gripped cold as my mug now. Thoughts of my pain touch not your sweet brow. Trace your heart out for me. Just let your fi yourself fly free. Write your words, sing your song, little girl dancing strong. Come share my warmth, come feel my love, come and be safe. Trace your heart out for me, just let yourself fly free. Write your words, sing your song, little girl dancing strong.
plug for him, that's Christian Conrad. Um, look him up on SoundCloud and look him up on Facebook. Great guy and a really talented musician. Um, this next piece is called Glimpse of an Atrium. Um, and it's about those moments when you have that feeling on your heart that something's missing and you don't know what it is. Buried deep under the skin, there is a gallery. The halls lined within stretch on for years. The frames are hung with a pattern and rhythm. Portraits of memories and of loved ones alike. Under an arch lit with love hangs a few. In the atrium of masterpieces I dwell. Amongst beauty I've sought, many elude me still. The empty spaces in this hall wound me deeply, but there is one image absent, yet burned in my mind. Like tracing paper over my eyes, it follows my gaze. It clouds my focus and bleeds into my vision. Like a specter of contentment, it caulks my seams. Through stained glass color, I see the vibrance of life, a life I seek to share reflected in portrait. What use are words when a picture speaks thousands? And yet, how many words did these paintings leave unsaid? Shall I try to describe the memory I cannot escape? To do so will deliver me further into its clutches. Shall I free, flee from this obsessive vacuum of spirit? To do so is a leap from the pan to the flames, flames that burn away this graceful cancer slow. This next piece is appropriate given the location. It's called the library. <laughs> Mahogany, walnut, poplar, and maple. But they're empty, not even a staple. Brass, stucco, marble, and stone. Miles and shelves without a stone, without a tome. A catalog worthy of Dewey's system. Filled with blank cards, the victims. Barcodes and label makers at attention. But all circulation sits in suspension. Carts behind a corral of velvet fencing yet parked without need of dispensing. Half-framed glasses lying dusty, the chain attached growing rusty. Missing its help for curator, it echoes. Outside, no one senses its death throes. Surely such a temple to wisdom will remain, even if new purpose must rule the domain. But the halls are known and unashamed. To be unlike the rose, they must be named. Recalling much, but remembering nothing, Visible, a future of such suffering. With no words on paper or print, the creatures who roamed here now extinct. How long will it stand testifying, a symbol of past lives mystifying? If books make the library stand, then what if your love makes me a man? My heart is not merely some shrine. My heart was never meant to be mine. My atrium is open to guests by the yard, but only resources for those with a card. A library needs a librarian, a bookkeeper, someone to seek further and dig deeper. They don't make the library exist. Rather, of the books does it consist. Encyclopedias, novels, and biographies. Make this place your home if you please. Digital, paperback, and hardcover. Dismantle my structure if never to be a lover. This next piece is written for uh, Humanities 103, in fact, when we had to write that love poem. This is called Love's Curtain Call. You, small, you saw the smoke and felt the embers. You felt her by your side, frantic and helpless. There was no time to get away, no time to hide. Despair began to grip the edges of your mind. Your fingers so entwined, clenched, white-knuckled. Your life flashed by a scattered and weary moment. You saw all you'd done and some of what you hadn't. A life so lived, yet so bare, so fulfilled, yet so devoid. She looked at you, pleading from the doorway, and you knew you had to live, maybe for the first time, and maybe for the last. So you took her and withdrew. Slowly you drew her close, whispered a story, and lying in warm embrace, you wrote the final chapters. Your setting and characters had already been decided, so together you spun a tale of romance at climax. You stepped into your roles of lovers without season, but soon your breath was choked and your light snuffed. Yet I still see the glow of the coals that encased you. They are fueled by the warmth of a show at curtain call. While the curtain may have fallen on your story, you live on in the applause of a moved audience. But the encore is for us to perform.
This last one is a longer piece. This summer, um, I lived on campus and had a lot of spare time on my hands, and I debated writing a small novella. Um, and oddly enough, it kind of coincides with um, the release of The Martian. Um, not actually intended to be um, anything like it, but um, having read it now, I realize it's quite similar. It's called Elbow Room. Man has always sought the expanses for something more. Intelligent life being limited to only our speck in this cosmos seems improbable. The final frontier has always beckoned. Since watching the Apollo documentaries on Nova, I've imagined myself among the stars and satellites. I always dreamed of being that hero in those jumpsuits. The orange outfit that meant quite the opposite of incarceration. The suit with old glory sewn to the arm was my first costume. My mom told me to use my helmet for carrying my Halloween treats. Instead, I walked around with candy apples stuck in my pockets and chocolates melting in my gloves because I caught my reflection in a window just once. To a six-year-old dreaming of space, that helmet looked just like John Glenn's. Many of my friends played cops and robbers, race car driver, or even rocket launch. But I played shuttle commander. I take it from the pad to splash down, including months on the space station in between. Drinking vodka with cosmonauts and playing zero-G ping-pong with the Chinese, I'd shake hands with Nixon and ask him how things were looking in the hotel business. I'd ride in convertibles at parades. I'd meet people from all walks of life. One of those people could be the person I'd share this walk of life. After being to the moon, she wouldn't seem so out of reach. No bridge game would be complete with our, uh, without our dynamic duo. I grow old telling our kids and their friends and all their kids and friends the story of harrowing launches and re-entries, of stars that would fill my visor and of a place where horizons are imaginary, of man's giant steps and leaps, of a time when I saw the speck of mud we call home and I could love it all from such great heights. I'd ramble much like I am now, but no one would shush me for they'd feel the gravity of what I experienced none. By middle school, I was sure of this destiny. The answers to life's questions would be floating just beyond the reach of our rockets. But just imagine the pursuit. Imagine all the things I'd learn and do along the way that would make such a fruitless quest worthwhile. And like King Arthur, triumphantly I'd return from the fiery pyre on the lake of constellations. But today I'm writing this from that pyre. It's been nearly 30 years since middle school. I grew in many ways, but not the ones I actually expected. I grew aloof and I grew distant. I grew to be ruled by logic and factuality. I grew cold and focused. This is often the world of those who leave the only man the world has ever known. But my family couldn't keep up. Beautiful people didn't enjoy my company. I could never understand how reaching my true potential and being all I could be would make me so unrelatable. So here I am, unsure of where they are, I can see the patches of green and brown they live on, but I can't see them. I can't see anyone from here. It's been two weeks. The satellites below my orbit are beginning to drift. Some are colliding and disintegrating. Others are just falling further out of orbit. My station is staying put, but it's an eerie feeling to see everything else up here seeming to hurtle back to Earth. My faith in the science that brought me here and keeps me here is certainly sound. Since I was a little boy, I knew that if we could put a man on the moon and bring him back, that our engineers could do just about anything. But the more of Earth that I see, the more terrified I am of its enor enormity and might. As an ambassador to the stars, I'd hate to think that my own demise would be a result of a gradual but swift journey home. I've traced some grids on one of the SB rec portholes. When the station rotates to align its antennas towards Houston, I check to see how much more of the planet I can see. I pray that my rudimentary measurements reflect just this orbit purging. I'd hate to think of what else expanding gaps might mean. Thank you.